progress. Okay, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful, Lord, uh, for the Sabbath that's coming and uh, for the time that we have to study together. We have missed the time uh, that we have spent in the mornings this past week, and we're thankful to once again be opening your word together. We ask for your Holy Spirit to guide and direct us in this study. We ask that you can bless those who are searching for truth, that you can guide them. And we pray for all the contacts that we have with others, especially on the Sabbath, that we can glorify your name. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, good evening, everyone. And um, what we're looking at here, this is a little bit of a brief uh, uh, diversion from our study on the presidents of the United States, uh, except that uh, we're going to come back to it here a bit later in this study. But um, this is a, a book, which I sent you the PDF of, and this is a, uh, a book written in 1863. And the date that he has for um, his preface, when he writes his preface, is an interesting date. This is June 9th, 18, 1863. And what's the significance of June 9th? If I said June 9th, 2018, what would that remind you of? Italian camp meeting. Yeah, so the Italian camp meeting, the 9-11 prayer, closing the Sabbath, and that is really where our time setting starts. Um, Jeff is going to close the, 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 the camp meeting. On the next day, Parminder is going to present the idea that we can set dates and um so that's going to be from the way that daniel from brazil counted it he counted it from june 10th 126 ordinal days to october 13th but i counted it as cardinal days from june 9th so june 9th becomes this dividing line from when our movement uh is not time setting and time setting is then accepted. So, so June 9th is an important date in that sense. And then, of course, 1863, that's the end of the prophetic mirror in 1863. And from there, we're going to count um, 126 days to 1989 and 151 days to 2018, which was the original year that Parminder had used time setting back in 2012 to predict 2014 as the Sunday law, which of course was incorrect. But uh, so it's kind of interesting that this book on Palmoni is, um, has that date attached to it. Now we know Palmoni is the wonderful number um, that's taken from Daniel 8.13. And, and he's going to talk here about the numerals of scripture and it's very interesting, this first chapter. So we want to read through this, and we'll discuss it a little bit. And um, it's just interesting how much insight he has into what we're doing presently. So he says, as the subject of this inquiry is one that will be new to most readers, and as the principal drift of it will not appear all at once, it seems proper to state beforehand what are some of the results which may be expected from it? And this I will do in a hypothetical form. Suppose it had been our fortune to alight on some valuable historical documents of the olden time. Suppose these documents being examined were found to contain a very precise chronology covering a period of thousands of years and interspersed with lively narratives of the most interesting character. Suppose further that the contents of these documents were of a kind to provoke much discussion, to excite curiosity, to satisfy in part and in part to baffle that eager desire of knowledge which is natural to man. We can readily imagine 
in such a case what pains would be taken to make out with precision the record thus brought before us to sum up its peculiarities to ascertain if possible the principle on which it was constructed now the bible is such a collection of ancient documents it contains a chronology such as had been described yet strange to say the effort to draw out that chronology as a whole to present it honestly as it is and to examine and account for its characteristic features is even to this day almost a new thing there have been plenty of attempts to amend the chronology of the bible to set it forth symmetrically in its own proper guise has been aimed at by few and has never perhaps been achieved with entire success by any so if we think back to 1863 um, and we even go back to Usher's chronology in, in the 1600s. Um, and, and there's many other different chronologies which the Millerites used. Uh, we can see that people are interested in the chronology itself, but he's talking about something more than just chronology. He's talking about looking at this as a whole as having some kind of uh, witness to the truthfulness of it of it um, as God's word so we'll see further as he talks about this suppose further that an honest effort being made to give this chronology as it is it should thereupon appear to abound in curious parallelisms in strange coincidences and in symmetries of the most remarkable and rhythmical description Suppose it should be marked in every part by the recurrence of certain mystical turns of years, not in a random way, but at intervals and in proportions elaborately exact. Suppose, in short, that this chronology should prove to be constructed on a system. Suppose, finally, that a key to this system should appear in certain numerals, such as 5, 7, 8, 13, and the like, which can be shown by a rigorous induction and by scientific tests to have a definite spiritual meaning over and above their arithmetical, arithmet, arithmetical value. Now, he mentions here Brown's or, Ordo Seclorum as the nearest approach to a success regarding somebody laying out the chronology. But in one or two points, as I expect to show, he has substituted conjecture for facts, preferring epochs of his own to those given him in scripture. Now, I, I mentioned this footnote here because this is kind of an important point. So we know that Usher has a chronology, and and we've used Usher's chronology as Seventh-day Adventists for a long time. And we see certain things in Usher's chronology. But when we had worked out the chronology in this movement, we saw things that we couldn't have seen before. And the approach that we used was to just accept the Bible chronology. That is, we weren't going to amend it. We weren't going to find verses that didn't fit our system and then declare them as typographical errors, right? So once we allowed the chronology to speak by itself, then we could see these structures. And that's what he was doing. That's what he's talking about. We need to lay out this chronology in a way that we can see we can see these structures and, and just lay out the Bible as it is. Now, when he talks about some people using um, the, uh, where is it here? Anyway. Well, pl plenty of attempts to amend the chronology, but also I've seen a lot of people try to, um, they have some system in view, some idea uh, or pattern, maybe jubilee cycles or sabbatical cycles or cycles of 251 years one guy had. And then they force the, the chronology of the Bible to fit their theory. And that's not what he's talking about. He says what we need to do is to just lay out the chronology and then see that there are things in it that are going to speak to its design. So he says, in such a case, the proof of design in the peculiarities of the numerals of scripture would be of such a character as no one could candidly disregard. 
the notion of chance coincidences would be absolutely excluded. Of course, one thing, what has we seen, even people in this movement, when, when we look at these coincidences of scripture, and we know that they show design, what have many people done with that? Make predictions? Well, I'm talking about, we have proof of design, but what have people done? Have they been able to uh, look at this candidly? Could they disregard it? There's cherry pickers. Yeah, so, so people have said coincidences mm -hmm. aren't of God. Right. So they've said we can't we, we can't look at any of this evidence of these dates and these structures. Um, that the Bible doesn't really deal with that. Right. So we, we've experienced that in this movement, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And but yet we know that 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 is something that really. You can't honestly argue against, you know, simple examples, the prophetic mirror, that all of the years in which the prophetic mirror has its dates that are marked, there's eight dates, you know, 742, 723, 677, um, 457, um, 508, 530, um, wait. 508, 538, 1798, 1844, and 1863. These are all the way marks of the prophetic mirror. And each one of those dates has is, is connected with a, um, a leap year that is going to begin uh, in connection with the spring equinox. So I'm not going to go into that. But the chances of that occurring are so absolutely impossible by chance that you would have to accept it as design. And yet it couldn't be a design that the Bible writers had somehow thought up. That is somebody who says, well, the Bible is just written by men. They would have to admit, if they looked at it honestly, that the chances of the prophetic mirror uh, producing those we, we never created the prophetic mirror based upon that. So we use Bible prophecy, and then we look at it afterwards, and we notice something. And so that's what he's really going to be talking about next. He says, but suppose further that the system thus discovered should be latent. Now, what does latent mean? Anybody have a definition for the word latent? Usually that's a delay, right? It's not really a delay. It's something, well, a dictionary definition of latent um, is of a quality or state existing, but not yet developed or manifest, hidden or concealed. Now, um, I always think of latent in connection with latent heat. So that is, um, when you take water and you change its state, um, from uh, when, you, when you boil water, for instance, you have this uh, energy that's stored in this um, the steam, right? And so what happens with that uh, energy? Because it takes a lot of energy to move water from uh, being water to being a gas. I don't know if people know about this physics of, of water, but how does that, how's that demonstrated? It's more spread out and sporadic. Or okay. Busy. So if you come in contact with steam, uh, what will it do to you? Moisten you. Well, yeah, it depends on, so it will, condense if it condenses it's going to release the heat that's in it right mm -hmm. now if you get very close to steam it can burn and it can burn more quickly uh, 
and, and more severely than wa hot boiling water itself. Right, so that's that's latent energy or latent heat that's stored in that steam. And so when it condenses, it will release that heat. So these principles of, of latency, when we're dealing with something like scripture, what are we talking about? Yeah, steam is hotter than boiling water, as Iran said. That's what I was trying to say. So when we think about something that's latent, it's something that's not yet manifest. It's stored up in scripture. And it's stored up in a way that's not readily obvious. So now he says in the same sense that the laws of nature are latent. I just used one of them, but that's more direct. He says, in other words, that it should be obvious enough when once pointed out, but of a character to elude casual observation and discoverable only on the application of certain experimental tests. So has our movement been involved in this discovering uh, these latent truths in Scripture? Most definitely. And, and was it done by casual observation? No. Okay, so it was a lot of work, right? And and he says experimental tests, and I'm not saying that, you know, we've been experimenting, but in a sense we have in the idea that we started with this hypothesis, and as we continue to work at it and examine it, so this is what I did when I started studying chronology, I said, well, if... The, the prophetic mirror is correct, the Bible chronology should witness to it. And But as I started to examine those things, we started to recognize that there was a lot that we hadn't noticed. These periods of, of structures, the structure of prophetic chronology. So that the 2520 uh, showed us all kinds of things that we wouldn't have seen if we never had it about Bible prophecy in the periods in the Bible. So he says, suppose one key to this system should be found in two or three seemingly casual utterances of the New Testament and another key or two in three well-known dates of ordinary history. Suppose generally that it should be, uh, that its secret should lie like the secret of Samson's strength in those parts of Holy Scripture, scripture which, which critics are apt to consider a fair subject for their scissors, which being unimportant, they can clip and pare at pleasure. The orbiter dicta, as such passages are learnedly called, or in text manifestly corrupt, or totally irreconcilable, or branded with any other of those phrases by which interpreters put the blame of their own stupidity upon the sure word of God. So an example of this, um, and I'm not going to use one from the New Testament, but he, he's going to look at some of those from the New Testament. Um, but if we take something like Jeroboam was anointed when he was eight, and he was also uh, says he was anointed when he was 18. So what do critics of the Bible say about that? Do they accept that he was anointed twice? No, they don't. Right. So they say, oh, one must be a typo. Right. So they say when it says he was anointed when he was eight, that's just a typo that crept into scripture. But it's actually one of the arguments I use to show that Daniel was taken captive in the fall of 607. And so sometimes these things that people have problems with in the Bible they become keys to unlock Bible prophecy and other histories. So he says, in such a case, there would be a decided evidence of a supernatural design in the numerals of Scripture. Suppose, finally, that the system should be found not only consistent with itself, but in harmony with the general scheme of nature and revelation, that it should be found to ramify into the minutiae of scripture names and scripture types and into the dates connected with those names and the numbers connected with those types 
and should seem to run through the whole of the sacred text from Genesis to Revelation in fibers as minute but as organic as the capillaries of the human body. Nay, should occasionally take hold of things outside of scripture times and overleaping hundreds of years between should seize upon ordinary history precisely at those points where, supposing the system to be divine, it might be expected to seize on it. So, I mean, this is said in a much different way than we would normally say it nowadays. But what is he saying? That What is he supposing here? So this is his supposition. What is, the, what is he describing that this movement has done? So he says, scripture names, scripture types, the dates connected with those names, and the numbers connected with those types, that they run through the whole Bible from Genesis to Revel Revelation. And, and he says like fibers as minute, but as organic as the capillaries of the human body. And these are really the lines of scripture, these stories, these accounts, um, these wheels within wheels this structure that we see something when he talks about organic, something that is, is living. And that we can also apply this to events outside of, um, of the Bible in what we would call ordinary history. So when we did something like um, looked at Hiroshima, and found that it was the 26th day of the fourth month, that we could take all of those dates connected with the bombing of Japan, and we could connect them with the symbols of Ezekiel and um, Josiah Litch's prophecy. So the prophecy of Josiah, the prophecy of Josiah Litch, and also with Millerite history, with the symbols of midnight and the midnight cry in a whole structure. We could see that that is that it's something that's very precise. Can we see that? And and it wouldn't make sense for somebody to criticize that. That is one of the real problems I had, and I'm not just trying to be hard on on the people who rejected this chronology, but when I look at what we found with Hiroshima, for instance. There is no way that that could be not true, that we, we could have those dates dealing with, you know, um, you know, the dropping of the, not just the atomic bomb, but when it's first tested, when the, um, the ultimatum is given, whatever it's called, I can't think of it right now. Um, and, and then also, uh, Nagas Nagasaki, and um, and then also uh, Kotur Kokura, and and all the other dates there. I mean, they're the dates that that are given to us, and all of them witness to our our message, and yet people could take that and say it's not important because something didn't happen the way that we expected. But I don't think you could take that witness and just cast it aside. Any thoughts on this, what he's talking about here? I mean, I think it's quite remarkable that he's writing about basically what we have done in this movement. Any thoughts? No thoughts on this so far? <clears throat> he says, the supposition may seem extravagant, and I do not profess to be able to make it good to the utmost, supposing, however, that it can be proved even in part, and that in such instances as are capable of being tested mathematically, it should be shown to hold true 
then the evidence of a supernatural element in scripture, of a supernatural life pervading its organism, would not at all fall short of a scientific demonstration. The present inquiry is an effort in that direction. It does not pretend, however, to cover the whole ground. It is an examination of one little corner of a vast field of inquiry, a field more familiar to the early church than to Christians of our times. The great and fertile field is the symbolism of scripture. So it is true that people in the past would have understood this much more than people in the present, especially Christians uh, in the present and even Adventists in the present. So he says, anyway, the inquiry divides into three parts, which as originally undertaken were three separate investigations begun at different times and from different motives with no idea when they were begun and that they would be found to be connected. So in discovering this himself, he was looking at different things that he was studying and found that they were related. And this is kind of what happened to us. The first is merely a summary of the six epics and six days of preparation for Christ's kingdom, an arrangement adopted by the writer many years ago, partly for its convenience and partly for the beautiful analogy it presents to the six days of creation. So have we done anything similar to that? using the six days of creation as tip typological. Haven't we used the same application on 6,000 years? Yeah, and, and so, yeah, so in the 6,000 years, and, and he doesn't divide the, the epics, uh, exactly a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years. But he looks at the, that there's a structure that the six days of creation are symbolical of these periods of time. And we've done this sort of in, in another way because we've used the reform lines. So in our study of understanding the line, uh, we've recognized that there are these periods, these seven divisions of time. Um, which we would call, you know, the arrival of the first angel's message, the formalization of the message, the empowerment of the message, and the arrival of the second angel, etc., all the way up to the arrival of the third angel. So we have these seven way marks, and that we can divide all of history into these seven way marks, and that we can then zoom in on these way marks and see, again, this structure of seven. So... So he's taken what we did um, in one of our earlier studies dealing with, um, um, I can't remember the title of the study that we did, but we started with Genesis, you know, chapter one, and we looked at, at uh, creation. And uh, we could see that there was this reform line in creation, but that this expanded into other reform lines, but it, particularly to the entire reform line of of the history of mankind right so this is what he has done so he started looking at this seeing the six days of creation represented something symbolically leading up to christ's kingdom and he says the second is a simple summing up of the dates and periods given in the hebrew scriptures this was an undertaken with a view to correct two or three obvious errors in brown's ordo Ordo seclorum, and with an idea that the mistakes of this ingenious author being corrected, the symmetries which he points out, would prove to be delusive. So he was trying to basically disprove Brown's Ordo seclorum. So this is a bit, Ordo means world, seclorum just means it's basically the history of the world um, or the chronology of the world, I guess. Ordo order the order of the world i guess is what it is ordo means order seclora so means world um so anyway he had this chronology that's just the title of his chronology and he had some mistakes in it but brown had noted noticed some symmetries well so this author here is was examining those things trying to find uh that there was a flaw he didn't he didn't accept that these symmetries were real 
And that's very similar to what I did when I was looking at uh, the 2520. I was trying to basically disprove it, not to prove it. The result, however, was entirely the opposite. Few of the parallels, parallelisms were touched by the correction. That is, once you make the corrections in Brown's chronology, it didn't really affect anything. So, so one thing we can see from that is even um, a chronology that has some mistakes is still going to have some of these structures are going to be seen. And he says, while many not noticed by Brown and of more systematic character than those which, which he had noticed were brought out to view. So as he refined the chronology, he saw even more that there was a systematic character to the chronology of the Bible. And so if this author uh, were alive today and he had gone through Stephen's uh, uh, table history, I think he would accept uh, that this is even more systematic. It is, as we've refined the chronology of the Bible, our understanding of it, through the acceptance of the 2520 as the key, that it's actually brought to view that something that this guy was just touching on the surface. He was just noticing some things. But because he doesn't have a correct chronology completely, he has some things quite right, but other things a little bit off, he wouldn't be able to see some of the things that we see. Um, so he says, his mistakes, in fact, conceal the most beautiful of the parallels. And though he gives instances enough to show that there is something very remarkable in the sacred times and seasons, yet there are hardly enough to prove the principle that seems to pervade the entire scheme. In the table of dates, as corrected in the present work, the general plan comes out so clearly that it may be taken in at a glance. And so we can say that the same if we were to look at this guy's chronology, we would see that there are some errors that if he had <coughs> corrected, he would even see greater things. And so that's what our goal has always been to do is to understand the chronology of the Bible so that we can see what's there, not to force the Bible into some system that we have already proposed and, and find faults with the Bible where it doesn't uh, meet our ideas. And that's usually what man does. In the table of dates, as corrected in the present work, the general plan comes out so clearly that it may be taken in at his glance, as he says. And we're going to see that that's going to be true as we continue to study further. Now, he says the third branch of inquiry is a curious, and I fear may be thought of a rather frivolous one. It is an examination into a point familiar to the early church, and not without interest to some of our matter-of-fact moderns. It began with an attempt to ascertain how far the strange coincidences connected with the so-called nominical number eight are capable of rigid proof or are merely oddities of the kind which may amuse an idle moment. So this, for him, and the reason why this is interesting to me now, is we're dealing with the eighth president, right? The eighth head, however we want to look at it. And he does some studying into the number eight. That seems to be one of the big things that, um, that he discovered, is that the number eight, its significance in scripture. And, and so I think that's something that's really going to apply to our study at the present time. So the number eight are, are, are capable, the coincidences of the number eight are capable of rigid proof or merely oddities. So he's trying to, to see whether that is the case. Amuse an idle moment, but for the more serious point of view are unworthy of regard. So that's how a lot of people look at these things, these coincidences of numbers. Having investigated eight, I was led to take up seven uh, with the same object in view. This brought me to the examination of uh, some other sacred numbers. I've not given all the results of this inquiry. Those that I have given, however, are fair samples of the rest and may serve to show, if nothing more, that the early fathers had some excuse for their devotion to this curious branch of study. It was after I had made some progress in the third of these inquiries that I noticed how intimately they were connected. 
how the table of dates fell within the scheme of days and epochs, and what light the sacred numbers sh shed on the peculiarities of the table of dates. With these remarks, I invite the reader to accompany me on a short excursion into this region of sacred chronology. It is not as dry a field as most people imagine. There are flowers and fruits in it. And though the flowers may be partly of that kind which a learned and devout fancy can create at pleasure, yet many of them may be, and some of them doubtless are, of his handiwork, who orders the times and the seasons, who numbers the very hairs upon our heads, who determines man's days and the number of his months, and who may intentionally have clothed the otherwise dry details of time's progress with something appealing to the imagination out of that same abounding goodness which furnishes springs in the desert or hangs the delicate and ethereal harebell upon the face of a bare rock. And I may say in conclusion that the difficulties of the inquiry are less than might be supposed. An English Bible, and concordance, a moderate facility in the rule of simple addition, access to a few of the settled dates of ordinary history, and a willingness to trust one's own rather than other people's eyes is all the critical apparatus that will be needed for our purpose. So what does this remind us of? How is he approaching his study? How is he telling us to approach the study? Similar to Miller's rules, correct? Right. He's comparing the historical events in the light of the Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he and you know, so we don't need, I mean. Obviously, we've spent a lot of time delving into these things. And so somebody on the outside might say, well, you know, this is like beyond me. It's, it's too involved. It's too detailed. But the thing is, people can test these things out and they don't need, you know, they don't need to be a scholar. They just need to be someone who's willing to spend time studying God's word, following Miller's rules, using a concordance knowing a little bit about about history and and i think this willingness to trust one's own rather than other people's eyes is something that is really a major part of miller's rules is his last rule where he talks about you must have faith and and that you know people who just trust in other people's opinions of course aren't going to find the truth. We have to have a faith and trust in God. Perhaps also I might ask the reader to divest his mind of any undue and superstitious bias against the words sacred, typical, mystical, or like. For if all nature is a mystery, if there are sermons and stones and books in the running brooks, surely we may expect to find even the arithmetic of scripture in the arithmetic of scripture, more things than are dreamed of in, a, in our philosophy. Um, and he just makes a note here about Dr. Christopher Woodsworth, who um, sees that there's something that's, that's here in the symbolic meaning of numbers in Holy Scripture, that it deserves more study and attention than it has received in recent times. So we are on a ground in what we have done in our study that really is the same ground that where the foundation was laid for Seventh-day Adventism and for this movement. So he's talking about the same thing that we are doing um, in a little bit more uh, flowery language than we generally use nowadays. But I think it's pretty clear is, is it you know, he's a good writer. It's, it's a clear communication that he's giving us.
Now, I'm going to change gears a little bit here, but um, any final thoughts on this? I'm, I'm going to come back to some things in this book later on. It's going to take a few minutes to really think this through. Yeah. Well, you have the PDF. I sent it to everyone. Right. Um, now, where he gets interesting in the book for me is the number eight. And, and so we're going to address some things regarding that. So we're going to come back to the book here. Now, I'm going to go to the scriptures here. I'm going to bring pick up on a point that we had touched on last Friday. And that point had to do with the genealogy of Christ. So Christ is descended from, who's the last king of Judah that Christ is descended from? Manasseh? No, not Manasseh. He's not. So we got the kings of Judah. Right. The, the last king of Judah is Zedekiah, but we know that Christ is not descended from Zedekiah. Which of the kings of Judah is the last king of Judah? Okay, so Aran put there Jehoiachin. Right, so Jeho Jehoiachin. Now, it's interesting here, and this is something that's rather interesting. I don't know how many people have looked into the genealogy here in Matthew. Now, there's two genealogies in the New Testament of Christ. One would be referring to the genealogy of Mary, and the other would be referring to the genealogy of Joseph. And, and in this case, um, uh, Matthew is giving us the genealogy of Mary. So Christ is descended from Jehoiachin, uh, through Mary. So he's actually literally the seed of David. But he's also has a has a genealogy which goes back to um, um, to a, a, a different son of Solomon. So in this case here, this is what we would call uh, the kingship line. So we have, uh, I'm just going to go back, read some of this. Jesse begat David the king. David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. And Solomon begat Reboam, Rehoboam begat Abijah, Abijah begat Asa, etc. So this is the chronology of the kings. And then you're going to have this is kind of interesting. Uh, Ezekiel, uh, Hezekiah begat Manasseh. Manasseh begat Ammon. Ammon begat Josiah. And it says, Josiah begat Jeconiah, so that's Jehoiachin, and his brethren, about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Now, what does this mean here? Did Josiah beget Jehoiachin? So Josiah, King Josiah, how, how many sons of his became king? From, from the way you're asking the question, I would have to say no. Yeah. So Josiah, yeah. So Josiah did not beget Jeconiah or Jehoiachin. He had uh, Mataniah, who became Zedekiah. He had um, uh, Jehoahaz. And he also had um, Jehoiakim. Those are his three sons who all became king. But Jehoiachin is not a son of um, Josiah. So what's happening here? Are they jumping a generation? Okay. So we, we would say they're jumping a generation. Um, the question is why? Well, if we look, if we were comparing this with the the priest line that is shown out of Ezra, 
we can see directly that there were several priests that we are well familiar with that were being not being listed by Ezra. Okay. So, yeah. So now we're going to see something quite interesting here. Um, so what we would say is that Josiah actually begat, um, um, what did they call him? Uh, anyway, it's going to be Jehoiakim and, and his brethren. So there is, now I don't like to say there's a typo here, but we can quite clearly see that there is, um, and, and I'll show you why here in a second, uh, because there's a system that's given here, and it says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away of Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. Now, if we were going to count these, so we're going to do this, um, so we're going to have Abram, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Judah, right? So that's going to be the kingship line. Pharez, um, uh, Esram, Aram, Aminadab, Nason, Salmon, um, Boaz, Obed, Jesse, and David is the 14th. Okay? I don't know if people counted along with me there. I was counting on my fingers. So that's 14 generations from Abraham to David. Correct? Understood, yes. Okay, and then we're going to go uh, Solomon. So that's going to be the next group of 14. Rehoboam. Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joram, um, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, and then we're going to come to the 14th, which would be when is when does the captivity occur? It occurs under Jehoiakim, right? So wouldn't Jehoiakim be the 14th? Not not Jehoiachin. You would think so. Yeah, okay. And then you're going to have now Jehoiachin. So this should read Jehoiakim and his brethren about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And then you would have follow with Jehoiachin, but we're going to say Jehoiakim is the 14th, and now we have Jehoiachin, um, Salaltiel, Zerubbabel, Abuid, Abiud, Eliakim, Azor, uh, Zadok, Achim, Elud, Eliezer, Matan, Jacob, Joseph, and then Christ. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the carrying away of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon unto Christ are 14 generations. So if we don't have Jehoiachin in there, we only have 13 in that second group. Now, of course, in the New Testament, we do have different documents, and, and I'm not talking about the corrupted Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, but we do have other accounts of this. And for some reason, of the document that ended up that the King James was translated from doesn't have Jehoia Kim in there. And, and I'm not sure why, but does anybody have problems with that? I mean, I don't like saying that the Bible has... Uh, uh, typographical errors, but it appears that Jehoiakim was left out, not by the author, not by Matthew, because Matthew's counting 14 generations, but we would only see 13. And one of them that we know as a fact from other witnesses in scripture, that Josiah did not begat uh, Jehoiachin. And, and, and Jeconiah, 
that is Jehoiachin, not a Jehoiakim. A any thoughts on that? I don't know if people have... It's kind of hard to introduce something like this and if you hadn't thought about it. Right. Now let's, uh, let's just do a little bit of a study on this. Now, the importance of this you'll see as, as we go on. Uh, it says, some read Josiah begat Jachim and Jachim begat Jeconias, right? So there are uh, some other documents that do this. But in the treasury, treasury of Scripture knowledge, uh, which is very similar to the, the King James translators of the 17, I can't remember which year that is, Dwight. What, what's the year of that Bible where they put all the footnotes? 1769. 1769, right? So it's the 1769 King James. And uh, so these are basically the same footnotes. Uh, but when we look at this, we will see Jeho uh, all this here in 2 Kings 23, 31 to 37. Jehoahaz was 23 years old when he began to reign. Here, I'll just click on this. Um and he began to reign. He reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamotal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And so that Jehoahaz, that's the, the, the son of Josiah. And then he's also the brother of uh, Jehoiakim. So he's called Eliakim as well. So and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, referring to Jehoahaz. He reigned only three months. And Pharaoh Necho put him in bands in Riblah in the land of Hamath, that he might not reign in Jerusalem, and put the land to a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the room of Josiah, his father, and turned his name to Jehoiakim, and took Jehoahaz away, and he came to Egypt and died there. So an interesting point here is that Jehoahaz is... Um, taken off the throne by the Pharaoh of Egypt, and Eliakim is made king. So he's actually put on the throne by the king of Egypt. But in the third year of Jehoiakim, according to Daniel chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and demand tribute from Jehoiakim. So Jehoiakim then is going to have the king of Babylon as his protector. And Jehoiakim gave the silver and gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give the money according to the commandment of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and the gold of the people of the land, of everyone according to his taxation to give to Pharaoh Necho. And Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Zebudah, the daughter of uh, Padiah of Rumah. So we're going to see that Jehoiakim follows... And then, of course, we're going to have Jehoiachin as the son of Jehoiakim. And then we're going to have another son of jo uh, Josiah reign, and that's going to be Mataniah, whose name is changed to Zedekiah. So, so we can see there um, that we have in this scripture um, – what somebody might call a contradiction, but it, it definitely has to be a typo. So typos do exist, as Ellen White points out. But what is this telling us, this typo? So when we have something that shows up in the Bible that, that appears to be a contradiction, which it could be, in this case, it, it seems like it's just a mistake in, in the copying of this Gospel of Matthew at some point. What does this tell us when we examine this? What has been obscured? What is latent here? Part of the history. Okay. And, and we can discern this history by studying the scriptures. But you can see that here, even in this verse, that it's obscuring something that is quite clearly telling us that this symbolism of 14 generations, uh, these different three different periods of 14 generations, are they important as a symbol?
most definitely. Yeah. So they're given to us for a reason. And, and this genealogy of Christ, when we look at these 14 generations, um, let's, let's look at it another way. What is this first 14 generations? What is the purpose of it? From Abraham all the way to David. What is this about? Why is he dividing it this way? I mean, why does God divide it this way? Is it to show us a progression? Okay, there's a progression, yes. So there's three different divisions that we have of 14 generations. And if we go from Abraham to King David, so, I mean, this is marking something very significant. So this is going to be the line of Christ. That's one of the things it's talking about, from Abraham. So it's three equal divisions, also six times seven, or 42 in total, which is important. Yep, as Aran pointed out in the chat there. So this goes from Abraham. The promise given to Abraham is now fulfilled in David. And David, as all the kings of Judah, he is a type of Christ. But it's the seed of David to which this kingship of Christ is promised, right? He's the son of David. So what's the significance then with these 14 generations? What, what is this history? What would we do? How would we name it or describe it? Fulfillment of the covenant from Abraham to David. Okay, it's a fulfillment of a covenant, isn't it? So this is a covenant here. And in David, we see the height of the kingdom of Israel. So the promise made to Abraham comes to it its height, really, with David. I mean, some people could ar argue it's Solomon. But with Solomon, we see a falling away, right? Correct. So we, we could almost say it, at the beginning of Solomon's reign, we have now come to the height and now the next period is going to be this period leading up to the babylonian captivity and the babylonian captivity is going to be marked with not with zedekiah right because zedekiah is going to be at the end of that period it's going to come to the period to the story of um Jehoiakim, right? So again, we have Solomon's the first, Rehoboam, um, Abide, Abijah, Asa, Jehoshaphat, Joram, um, Oziah, Oz 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 um, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, and then Jehoiakim. So that's going to bring you to the Babylonian captivity. But then you're going to have Jehoiachin. So Jehoiachin now is the, the start of the third period. Now, Jehoiachin is also taken captive, is he not? And who's he taken captive by? So, so when we deal with the kingship and we deal with, I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, 
that we've discussed before. We know that Zedekiah is technically the last king of Judah. But Christ is not descended from Zedekiah. He's descended from Jehoiachin. So what would be the significance here in this period? So we have the period leading up to the Babylonian captivity, right? So we have Solomon. It's going to come to the Babylonian captivity. So you should have uh, the next period is starting after the Babylonian captivity with, with Jehoiachin. He's taken captive as well. Now, Jehoiachin becomes a type. What is Jehoiachin a type of? What happens to Jehoiachin? Resurrection. Okay. So in Jehoiachin's personal life, he experienced a resurrection. Now we know in Leviticus 26 that um, the third seven times is the one in which Jehoiachin is taken captive. Right? I will bring a sword upon you that ye shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant. And when ye are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you. And ye shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. And when I have broken the staff of your bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall deliver your bread again by weight, and ye shall eat. Right. This is, to me, the most part of Leviticus 26. But we do know literally that Jehoiachin had his bread delivered to him by weight because we have the, the Babylonian... Uh, um, uh, grain ration t tablets where Jehoiachin and his sons are mentioned by name. So this is the third seven times. In 597 BC, Jehoiachin is taken captive. And then we're going to have in Jehoiachin's captivity, I can't remember, I think the verse, what is it? I'll just search it, it's easier. I know it's at the end of Jeremiah, so maybe I'll just go there. I think it's in chapter, yeah, yeah, right at the end of Jeremiah. And it came to pass in the seven and thirtieth year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, in the five and twentieth day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Zu Judah, and brought him forth out of prison, and spake kindly unto him, and set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon, and changed his prison garments. And he did continually eat bread before him all the days of his life. And for his diet there was a continual diet given him of the king of Babylon, every day a portion until the day of his death, all the days of his life. Okay, so... <clears throat> Can we see in Jehoiachin a type of something? How would, how would we describe it? We can call it a resurrection. And we've noticed this before, that it's the 25th day of the 12th month. Now that's on the biblical calendar, but as a symbol, it's December 25th. Now, so Jehoiachin being released from prison, is he typifying the release from captivity at the end of the 70 years? It could be. Okay. And, and I would say that he does but he also represents other things so there's lots with jehoiachin so we know that christ is going to descend from him and and that we're going to be given this line from jehoiachin to to christ as 14 generations we also know that he's going to be in prison for 36 years 
So he's taken captive. Um, and that's going to be in... can't remember it's going to be where that is when he's taken captive. It's going to be here, the temple burned to follow Jerusalem. And probably I need to go to for second Kings. Okay, so... So this is uh, 2 Kings chapter 24. It came at the time of the servant. It came at that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. And Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, went out of the king of Babylon, out to the king of Babylon. He and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers and the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign referring to Nebuchadnezzar's eighth year of reign. And he carried out thence all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold which Solomon the king of Israel had made in the temple of the Lord as the Lord had said. And he carried away all Jerusalem and all the princes and all the mighty men of valor, even 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained save the poorest sort out of, of the people of the land. And he carried away Jehoiachin to Babylon, and the king's mother, and the king's wives, and the officers, and the mighty of the land. Those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon, um, etc. So, and then we're going to see Mattanias put on the throne. Now, the Babylonian Chronicles gives an account of this. And they say that it's in the second day of the 12th month, which is March 16th. 597 BC that Jehoiachin is taken captive. Well, that's when the walls of Jerusalem are bese are, are, are a breached after a siege. And, and it even says that Mataniah is, is put on the throne by the king of Babylon and his name is changed to Zedekiah. So this, this verse is attested to in the Babylonian Chronicles. Uh, so, so it's a pretty interesting detail. Now, um, so you're going to have Zedekiah on the throne, but has Babylon already conquered Judah in the time of Jehoiakim? So there's there's three captivities, right? Jehoiakim's third year in the the beginning of the reign of Jehoiachin, and then also in Zedekiah. So we have these three events. That's the second, third, and fourth of the seven times. So Babylon conquers them, but they still have a king on the throne. So technically, Zedekiah is the last king. But we can see that the Jerusalem is already conquered by Babylon with Zedekiah. And that's what it says, that it when uh, Jehoiakim is king, that's when the Babylonian captivity begins. But you're still going to have Jehoiachin and Zedekiah on the throne. But then we're going to overturn, overturn, overturn it. And, and we know from um, Spirit of Prophecy that that's referring to Babylon is taking, conquering Jerusalem. And the first overturning is Media Persia. The second overturning is Greece. The th then it's overturned to Rome. There's three overturns. And then where does the, the kingship go to after Rome? You guys aren't very talkative.
my brain is not that well in gear tonight. That's the, okay. my problem. Okay. So, um, so we know that it's going to go to Christ. So it's overturned, overturned, overturned. The third overturning is being overturned to Rome. And then we're going to have it finally overturned to Christ. Now, we have it overturned, in a sense, two times to Christ. Is the throne of David overturned when Christ enters heaven at his ascension? Repeat that question, please. So, is the throne of Judah overturned to Christ, like the throne of David, overturned to Christ? Does, does he come in the time of Rome, literally, in of, you know, pagan Rome? Is the throne passed to Christ then, when he enters into heaven? Does he receive a crown? Does he receive the throne of David? No. Okay. So he he partly does. That is, he's not going to reign on earth. But we know that the Bible verses that talk about Christ entering into heaven, you know, who is the king of glory, right? So Christ is a king. He enters into heaven as a king. But he still has a work to do as a priest, right? Because he's a prophet a priest, and a king. So he he can't take up his crown completely when he enters into heaven, even though he is a king. He's a priest king. Correct? Correct. Right, after, he has a priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. But he has to wait till the end of the world until he takes what is rightfully his. Now, are we still in the time of Rome, according to the scriptures? Does Rome go all the way to the end? So Iran says yes. I um, agree. Yeah. So Rome, yeah, Rome is the final kingdom. There's four kingdoms, right? Now, Rome has its divisions and its development, but it's still Rome. Rome, Rome's influence still exists, and it is the final kingdom, even though it's taking on different forms. And we can see that even in the United States, the symbols of the United States, how its government is operated. Um, it takes upon these Roman forms. And, of course, we see the papacy as well that still exists. And then we have a threefold union at the end, which is Babylon. But it's the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And in those characteristics, we can see that it's still Rome, which is, which is an important point. So when it comes to the eighth of those seven kings, we end with Zedekiah, Christ must be the eighth. And can we see that at the beginning of the Babylonian captivity, that we also have three Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. That the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, in a sense, are imitating that. I don't know if I'm making that clear. But do we see that when the Babylonian captivity begins, it begins with the second, third, and fourth seven times. That they're all part of that. That we just don't go back to... Um, you know, Jehoiakim, Daniel's captivity. That starts the 70 years. But remember, we have in each of those seven times, they all are going to end with a decree, correct? So Daniel's taken captive in 607, and his is going to end 70 years later when... Cyrus comes to the throne and six months later, so 70 years and a half, technically to the decree itself. But the 70 years captivity 
begins in the fall of 607 and ends in the fall of 537 and is followed by this decree. And then we know that Jehoiachin's captivity is a period of 140 years, which is a doubling of 70. And we know that the destruction of the temple marks another period of 70 years in 586 that is going to end with Darius's decree. So just like we have the three ages in Millerite history, and just like we have the three decrees that begin the 2300 days, those are prefigured by the three kings that are marking the beginning of the Babylonian captivity in this progression. Can we agree with that? I would have to think we can. So when we look at the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, in our understanding of uh, Revelation 17, and we can see the three heads at the end, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet represent, uh, we, we say the United States, the United Nations, and the papacy, correct? Yes. Okay, so we can see that that's a, a threefold union in a sense. And the, so those are of the seven, right? There, there's seven of them, but the last three, just as the last three kings of Judah, we can also see the last three heads in our understanding that this movement has had regarding Revelation 17, correct? Right. Okay, so we see that parallel there. So I probably should have an illustration or some way to illustrate this. So let me see. I don't know if I – I don't have anything. Well, I guess I could do this. Um, so. See if I can find this quickly. Okay, here's the way to look at it first. At least I have one illustration. So we have an illustration here of the last seven kings of Judah and the four seven times. So we can see here we have Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, and Jehoahaz. Right? But then we're going to have these three. Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, and Zedekiah. And these are seven, just like we have the seven heads. We have the seven kings. And we have a, a three at the end. That is, it's divided into four and three. Can we see that? These four are, are prior to the Babylonian captivity. But this is going to be the Babylonian captivity period. Can we see that 4-3 combination? Yeah, that's an interesting way of putting it, too. Okay. So this 4-3 combination can't be ignored by us because it's something that's been established. But we know that we're always going to have an eighth. In every 4-3 combination, do we have an eighth that follows? Yes. Okay, we do, right? So, I mean, and we're going to spend more time, because I, I don't want to go past 8.30. We're going to spend more time next week looking at this in more detail. Um, and, and we're going to come to this number eight. So we're going to come back to this, this paper where he deals with the number eight and what it symbolizes. But we can see that Jehoiachin... He symbolizes the second angel's message because he has a doubling, which Jeff, you know, clearly marked out. Um, he's anointed twice. He has the same name as his father. He has a period of 140 years attached to him instead of just 70 years. So it's a doubling of 70. And there's other things as well. And, and we can see that in these three, 
you know, we have one, Zedekiah, Christ doesn't descend from him, even though he's technically the last king. He's the seventh. But Christ is going to descend from Jehoiachin. And then we're going to have Jehoiakim as well. So these that's where the Babylonian captivity begins. So we'll see that in the seven heads, this same structure exists, and that the eighth has to be of the seven. And it can't be one of the seven, because Christ is not any of these kings. And that we've been misreading the last part of the structure when it talks about the eighth, that he's of the seven. We've taken it that he's one of the seven. And that, that can't be the case if we look at all of the types beforehand. Now, the eighth is a resurrection, as we will see. So hopefully this has been helpful, this exercise. So I know we, we spent a lot of time going through uh, an introduction to that book there, uh, which we're going to come back to some of the things that he says. And we'll tie it in with Revelation 17 and the presidents of the United States. And we will see that, it, that the eighth can't be Trump for the very simple reason that that's not what happens in any of the other eights. But that the eighth is always of the seven. And that it's a four, three combination. So it's four and three. And that four and three, we see in the prophecies of scripture. We see that in the trumpets and the seals, et cetera, the churches. And, and to understand what we're talking about in Revelation 17, we have to take into account all of those. Any final comments before we close with prayer? I'm just trying to wrap my head more around about this 4-3 combination and look at other examples of this. Yeah, and it's quite a bit to think about. I mean, because we have to bring together all kinds of things that we've studied in the past. Um, that we 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 studied, but we may not have at the tip of our fingers or in our memory stored completely. But that's that's why we have to take the time to go through what we understood in the past and see how it applies. So one of the things we can see, and and just kind of summing up where we're going and where we where we came from so we came from this point where we started studying revelation 17 based on the pioneers understanding and the pioneers understanding i think is solid but we also have an understanding in this movement regarding revelation 17 and i think that's also is solid but we've neglected to make the comparisons with all of these sevens and eights in the past and and it's, it's, it's God's, it's providential that the book, even though it has some problems with its chronology, um, he's laying out how we can understand the chronology of the Bible. And he's using Miller's rules to do so. And we should be able to do the same thing. We should be able to understand the chronology of the Bible simply in the way that, that, that God is showing us to do this with the symbols, with the types. But this is all related to the chronology of this movement and how we're looking at this history that's unfolding before us. And if we're going to understand this history correctly, we have to understand the history in the past and the way that God led. So I think it's pretty remarkable to me what's happening right now. Now, uh, before we close with prayer, just a reminder, Dwight's presenting at 7.30 mountain daylight time uh, tomorrow morning right Dwight yes yeah, until nine o'clock and then Stephen's going to be presenting in the afternoon at two o'clock so he's going to continue with his tabled history and then we're going to have our regular studies resume Sunday to Thursday and then next Friday we'll take up this study again but then the the Sabbath, not this Sabbath, but the following Sabbath, the, the 30th. 30th, 
we're going to have a Sabbath school and a church at, uh, and I haven't figured out the time exactly when we should do that, but I would prefer to start at nine o'clock. Um, and, um, but that's just my, my suggestion. So this is something maybe we should think about or talk about when we can talk about it in the morning studies, exactly what time that we're going to do that and, and figure out who's going to be speaking and doing what we haven't figured that out yet, but we've had time for prayer and contemplation and for personal study over the last week in the mornings, hopefully people have taken advantage of that time. And, um, so we still need our prayers for, for Dwight. We need prayers for people in this movement. Um, and, and for whatever God has um, in store for us as we continue to move forward in our studies. So uh, let's close with the word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so thankful for all the things you teach us for the Sabbath, and we just ask that you can continue to be with us in the Sabbath hours, that we can study together your word, and that we can be strengthened and enlightened, and that you can bring a conviction and a power in our lives. Bless each person who is studying these things, and we ask this and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.